Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And on our panel tonight, the Conservative Secretary of State for Wales, Alan Cairns, the Labour MP who ran briefly for the leadership of his party last year, Chuka Amuna, the leader of Plaid Cymru, Leanne Wood, UKIP's leader in Wales, Neil Hamilton, and the comedian who made his name on Mock the Week and now presents a podcast taking a sideways look at politics, Andy Parsons. Thank you very much. And you don't have to let the people here make the running at home. You can also get involved in the debate. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, texting 83981 will get you there. Let's have our first question. Natalie Matthews, please. After the unsavoury events today in Strasbourg and the resignation of Diane James after 18 days, is there a future for UKIP? Is there a future for UKIP after particularly the events of today and the resignation of Diane James? Stephen Wolfe and Mike Hookham in a altercation, which left Stephen Wolfe, of course, in hospital. Chuko Amuna. Well, I'm glad that Stephen Wolfe is OK. Um, there were reports earlier in the day that he may have bleeding to the brain. And, you know, whatever differences, political differences we may have, um, you know, we're all human beings. And I'm really glad that he's OK, he's conscious, and he's smiling, as, as he's put it. In terms of UKIP and its future, what is its point going forward? I mean, Neil might have something to say about that, but it has achieved the aim that it set out to achieve as a party. Now, if it wants to go beyond that and create the kind of Britain it painted a picture of wanting to create at the last general election, I think that would be highly undesirable. Uh, flat rate income taxes that give the top 1% a huge tax break whilst everyone else suffers, I don't like that. Uh, more private provision, perhaps private insurance in the National Health Service. Right. I don't particularly like that. And whilst, of course, I think we all would acknowledge that uh, migration foes and population change uh, pose challenges to any country, I dislike a lot of the narrative that comes out of UKIP, <coughs> which tends often to suggest that all of our problems as a country are down to immigrants, when nothing could be further from the truth. Yeah, we know you're you opposed to their views, yeah. but do you think they're collapsing? Well, who knows what their future holds? I think the bigger problem for them, <coughs> notwithstanding uh, the leadership, is what is the point of UKIP? And, you know, if the point of UKIP is the picture of Britain that I've painted them offering at the general election, well, frankly, I don't think it's something right. that most of us would want. Liam Wood. I think this could go one of two ways now. They could either disappear because they've achieved their political goal or they could become the anti-immigration party along the lines of the, the French Front National, um, that kind of right-wing um, uh, party that we see right throughout Europe. But this, to me, shows that really, at base, um, this is a party full of thugs. Um, Fighting in politics is just not on. It's not the way to, to carry, carry out uh, your political disagreements. Um, and uh, I would say, you know, it follows on from a referendum campaign where UKIP um, put forward some pretty strong arguments and, and I think encouraged some of the worst aspects uh, of politics to come out in people. And I'm referring there to to uh, statements that could be <coughs> referred to as being racist and we've seen um, a rise in hate crime since Brexit and uh, of course it fits in well right. with the infighting that's gone in the National Assembly and also the hints of misogyny that we've seen there. Um, the right. leader mm -hmm. referred mm. to me um, and my colleague Kirsty Williams as political concubines. That's 
prostitute, uh, right. for another word. So this is the kind of language and the kind of figure that we You're referring to we Neil, Ham about. Neil Hamilton said this. I, I am, yes. Who, uh, that who, was his maiden when, speech in the National right. Assembly. Yeah, okay. He referred to sexist language I'll explain. like when, that. Well, hang on a second. Not when, <laughs> he'll explain to me. But when, when you said uh, the party was full of thugs, somebody shouted out, how dare you? Uh, yes. Do you want... Because I resent being called a thug by a party that actually, by its very name, is a racist party. Excuse me? Yes, you are. <laughs> Plaid Cymru, the party of Wales. Wales for the Welsh. What about the rest of it? If, you, if I did that in, great, in England and said England for the English, I'd be in jail. No, excuse me. Um, I just have to stop. And I resent being called a thug. Well, look, people who have put, thrown punches in Strasbourg today, is that not thug thuggish behaviour? I resent uh, you suggesting that I come from uh, a racist party. My party is not a racist party. We are outward-looking, we are inclusive, we are internationalist, and in fact, we are the only <coughs> party in Wales who is putting forward a proposal for Brexit, which is outward-looking. Just All uh, right. the week before last... All right, Liam, no, 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 I'm sorry, you made your point. No, I, we, I've got to bring other people in, and we're talking about UKIP. I mean, you've made your counterpoint to him. The woman there in, in purple, yes. I have to disagree with Leanne. I find that Plaid Cymru are anti-English language, totally. I've seen it myself in my local village, where they're getting rid of the English stream in our local school. Well, we so, seem to be going down a very different road from the question. I've never had any <laughs> trouble from you, Ket. All right. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe we'll come back to this, but I think it's only fair we hear from uh, Neil Hamilton. Uh, who, who, <coughs> Neil, you've no doubt heard today that your big, the financier of UKIP um, says that unless you leave the party, he's going to leave UKIP and won't be supporting it because well, I think he I thinks can you behave that. disgustingly, <clears throat> spewing out bile today. Right. Well, um, first of all, I'd like to say that it's very dangerous when elected politicians, particularly if they're leaders of other parties, insult millions and millions of people who vote for their competitors. UKIP got four million votes in the general election in the United Kingdom. We elected seven members of the Assembly here in Wales only in May. Uh, we were the prime movers behind the Brexit vote, in which a majority of the British people voted to leave the European Union. And in Leanne's own UKIP constituency of the Ronda, I, I think I'm right in saying from memory that 56% of her own constituents voted against what she wanted, which was uh, to stay in the EU. And to call members of UKIP in their tens of thousands a party of thugs, I think is absolutely disgraceful. What's that fight on and then? Because two people got into a fight which they should certainly never have done so, but they're not in thugs, contravention they? <laughs> of UKIP's own rules. And I've anticipated this question, of course, this evening. And our own rules say, all elected members are expected to act at all times in a manner which reflects positively on the party, both in their personal and professional life. Elected members are expected to be aware that by virtue of their elected position, their actions are subject to greater public scrutiny and that poor behaviour can damage the party or bring it into disrepute. Well, all that's and, fairly obvious, isn't it? Well, it no, well, it, it is obvious. Well, you hardly need a rule and, to tell people not and, to hit and, each other. And I presume, I presume now that disciplinary action will be taken once uh, an inquiry is uh, uh, carried out and due process is observed. And if it uh, proves that somebody was guilty of throwing a punch and causing uh, some actual bodily harm, then actually that's more a matter for the police in a way than, than for a political party to decide upon. But okay, that, is, that is undoubtedly an action which yeah. could result in one or both of these individuals being expelled right. from the party. Yes, right, we do just... not condone this no, kind no, of no, behaviour, no, okay. and it is certainly not typical of our party. Yes. I've been in UKIP for 15 uh, Neil, years, and I've never uh, seen a fight no. uh, of this kind but before. But what you've just said is very interesting, because you're talking about Stephen Wolfe, because you said earlier on uh, the BBC, I think Stephen picked a fight, right? So you're talking I didn't about... say that. I, I, Stephen, I, said I think, told. picked a fight with an, and came off worse, is what you said. Yeah, I, I, I did been, say that. I was asked. <laughs> I was asked. No, but sorry. 
I'm not, I'm not trying to score a point of you. I'm not trying to score a point of you. The point is, you're clearly referring to Stephen Wolfe, yeah. front runner to be leader, and you're saying if that's true, he can't stand as leader. Well, and you know that the supporters, uh, Nigel Farage and um, Aaron Banks, want that side of UKIP well, as a leader. So I'm, if that doesn't happen, what the I'm party saying falls is that I've read, the, I've read the rule, I've read it out to this audience this evening, and in normal circumstances, what would happen is, in a disciplinary case of that kind, that those who are involved in such a fight would be suspended from the party pending the outcome of an inquiry. Okay. Are you calling uh, for a police uh, investigation? Uh, uh, well, I, I, this occurred in France. I don't know what the rules but do you think uh, there should be of a law are in France. Yes. But, but I would have thought, if it's a case of actual bodily harm, that this is a matter for the police. He's calling UKIP, for a UKIP, police UKIP, UKIP investigation now, but he probably won't be able to remember what he asked for tomorrow. <laughs> my... I mean, that's a trivial response, of course, but to a serious matter. But, uh, okay. but, 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 but the question was actually about, well, is there a future for UKIP? And yes, one isolated uh, event which is wholly to be deprecated and should not be tolerated is not representative of UKIP as a party which is now a major player, particularly in Wales, uh, uh, and, uh, now, the and, and the system. leader standing down, Diane James, after, what was it, 18 days as leader of your party? What's well, that I can't explain that. I didn't vote for Seems her. Seems a lot that can't um, be explained, I, 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 I thought she was not suited to the role, and I was oh, very right. surprised that she put herself forward. But, okay. uh, you know, the, the, we're not the only <laughs> party which sometimes elects an inadequate leader, are we? Andy Parsons. <laughs> Well, obviously, Nigel Farage is back, isn't he? The, uh, he's got a, a lot of things to, uh, to cope with at the moment. Uh, he's obviously supposed to be advising Donald Trump. How Donald is going to cope without him, I have no idea. <laughs> and we're all quite surprised, given that he is back as leader of UKIP, he's not actually on this panel tonight. Um, we were expecting him on question time. He's been on often enough. But the reason he was very keen to step back in and say, I am leader, was he was very worried that Neil Hamilton might actually claim that he was, in fact, the leader when Diane James had stepped down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's hear from the, the woman at the back there, in the very back in pink, yes. No, there is no future for UKIP because children are our future and I don't think they are going to be voting UKIP. Simple as no future. OK. Um, Alan Cairn. Well, I think we should all be grateful that uh, Stephen Wolfe uh, appears to be OK and uh, hopefully he'll be discharged from, uh, uh, from hospital. Now, I'm not necessarily best placed to uh, uh, answer how UKIP members or UKIP activists feel, but there is a serious job of work to do. And, we, in, and on June the 23rd, we voted in the referendum to leave the European Union. And there are serious challenges, and it's the government's job in order to focus and get the best deal for the whole of the United Kingdom in delivering on that instruction that came from the public. And UKIP will have represented a significant number of voters in the Assembly elections and the general election, but those people will feel let down as a result of the sort of antics that we're seeing uh, by the leadership and by the politicians. And I think that it's up to the government to act in a responsible way to continue that positive agenda, acting on the instruction, and I hope that other parties will play their part too. OK, I'm going to hear from one or two members of the audience, the woman over there, about UKIP, and then we'll move on. Yes. I just wanted to come back to the original question, really, if there's any need for UKIP, and I think that there will be a need for UKIP unless people start, you know, the, the government start building more social housing and, you know, they're, they're better paid jobs for people because people are actually dissatisfied in Wales. There are a lot of areas in Wales and in England that have suffered due to the, um, the di death of manufacturing. We may, come on to a bit, we may come on to a bit more of that okay. in a moment. You, you not certain think that. those problems, though, are they? You, sir. I think uh, Labour's inaction on immigration will always ensure that there is a UKIP. Jeremy Corbyn's doors wide open policy will backfire. All it'll, right. It'll just uh, fuel UKIP. And, and, and we have the back. Yes. The job is done. The minister summed it up there. It's time to act. For, for, time for action now. Um, we voted to leave the EU. That meant uh, working with people for UKIP. So I think the, the government and um, UKIP need to work together to you know, take us out of, uh, out of the, the EU. And, because at the end of the day, that's a Conservative over there. Well, what, uh, on the left, I, yeah, well, on, ste on the right. Steady on. Neil well, well, he, he, he was an MP. Yeah. <laughs> what? As I understand for... Yeah, yeah, he I'm wasn't. A, he wasn't yeah, exactly. an MP. That's a hundred years ago. Can I just confirm to everyone that was a long time ago? <laughs> but my point is, 
we need to work together now because um, I'm a civil servant and I'm not sure you know, where we're going with this now and it's for the government to you know, take action now and, and get us out of Europe. All right, we'll, we'll have a bit more about that. But I was trying to get to the person at the very back there. Yes. UKIP has got a toured manifesto, Stop Immigration. So how hard is it to elect a new leader to put that forward? A, a two words. Two words in the manifesto, Stop Immigration. And you approve of them? No, the, I, the certainly don't, I don't approve of UKIP in any shape or form. I think they're a shocking, shocking outfit. OK. And, <laughs> and, and last point, the woman here is trying to get in. And then we'll go to another question. Yes. I'd just like to remind the British audience that UKIP was the party that used a Nazi type of propaganda uh, in the EU referendum. <laughs> and thanks, the hand, the refugees was shocking, and if this is the future of not just of British politics, but of British political discourse and debate, we have a very bleak future. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, going to go on. So we've got that's quarter of an hour on UKIP, and we've got other subjects to talk about, some of which may uh, raise <coughs> UKIP policy as well. Uh, but just before we go on to the next question, next week we're going to be in the RAF Museum at Hendon, rather glamorous site in North London and the week after that in Hartlepool so if you want to come to question time be in the audience um, the details on the screen how to apply and I'll give them again at the end but Hendon North London next week Hartlepool the week after and right now a question from Lucy Locke please are Amber Rudd's proposals for companies to disclose how many foreign workers they employ encouraging xenophobia and racism in the UK there's been a lot of criticism of what Amber Rudd said at the party conference and what she's said uh, since then. Um, Alan Cairns, is it right to ask companies to disclose how many foreign workers they employ? Well, let me say in the first instance that immigration has brought huge benefits to our nation. Uh, they've benefited the economy, they've benefited public services, they've diversified and benefited our, our culture. So immigration is a positive thing. And I think where um, people get naturally worried, and rightly so, is when that immigration is uncontrolled. And therefore, the pressures that come about on public services, the competition for labour in many areas where maybe those companies are not fulfilling the obligations that they have in order to offer opportunities to working people here in the hall and across the rest of the United Kingdom. So what Amber Rudd has talked about is launching a consultation later this year uh, to see exactly what else can be done for non-EU migrants uh, to see, or non-EU immigration, to see what else we can do. So, for example, let me just highlight... Flushing some, out firms well, who don't have more skilled I'll, labour force. I'll come, I'll, forcing I'll, them to list how many foreign workers they employ. That's what she said on the Today programme. Is that what you want to see? Well, that'll be part of the consultation. You business. agree with it, in other uh, words? Well, oh, consultation that, that'll or what? Be, uh, that's, that, that's exactly what but she said. But it's in there your will mind be, to there do will it. Be, well, if I can answer the point, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll respond. I'm asking you the point. Let, let me highlight that... Um, in the last Parliament, we closed 875 bogus colleges who were offering courses to students um, that didn't effectively exist. People would come, they would register, and then they would never follow up the course thereafter. Now, at that oh, time, believe. we were called to be extreme because we took that strong action against those colleges. Now that is accepted as genuinely good practice because of the impact, the positive impact that would have had on uh, curbing immigration. And immigration from outside of the EU has come down by 13%. But we now need to look at what else we need to do and potentially uh, publishing the sorts of things that you've talked about. It already happens in the United States. Uh, employers talk about the proportion of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, employees that they have from outside of the US and from within the US. And that will be part of the consultation that we'll happily engage with with employers and they will right. be able to respond but, to that. But re reading between the lines, you... you you approve of the idea. You say it happens in the United States. You'd like to see it happen here. Well, I, so, absolutely, but I want, okay. business, I want businesses to engage, to right. uh, share what, how they feel they can better meet the needs of ordinary working people who feel they're not getting a fair deal, that they're not getting the benefits that the employers are offering. They feel it's a privileged few that are only benefiting. Those who are on the yachts and those who are, okay. uh, uh, are, are earning millions of pounds from pension funds, we need to change the policies that work for ordinary working people so they're getting a fair crack of the whip. Ch Chukumuna. Well, well, well the, the question was, are the proposals fanning the flames of xenophobia and racism? And I would say certainly the headlines definitely do that. I think this was a shocking suggestion 
not least because I actually asked Amber Rudd and her department how many EU citizens, how many EU nationals do they have working, not only in the Home Office but in its different agencies, they don't even collect the figures. So she's attacking these different companies and firms for the number of foreign workers that they employ and not knowing the number. She doesn't even know the number of people from abroad who are working in her own department agencies. So, look, what we need, in my view, if we're going to talk about immigration, is to have a proper balanced debate. And the problem is, you've got it played out on two poles. On the one hand, you've got those who say immigration is always fantastic, it doesn't pose any challenges to any community. I disagree with that. You have, on the other hand, the kind of Nigel Farage view of the world, which is that all of our problems are down to immigrants. Now, of course, migration population flows can pose challenges in the labour market, but that's why you properly enforce the minimum wage. Uh, community cohesion. We have to provide better support to people who are settling here to, for example, be able to speak English. Uh, we've got to make sure that local authority areas get the support that they need financially to deal with population change. But let's not throw the baby out with bathwater on these issues. There are 1.5 million Brits who are employed in EU citizen-owned businesses in our country. There are over 100,000 EU citizens who are helping to power our, our public um, services. And let's not forget all the Brits who are living abroad in other countries, not just in the EU, who benefit from the movement of people around the globe. So let's have a mature and sensible debate about this. Let's not have these gimmicks and stupid initiatives and headlines which stoke the flames of division. When after right. this EU referendum, we've got to bring people back together. Would you approve of... <laughs> Do you, do, you, do you approve of surveying employers to see how many foreign workers they have and if they have too many trying to do something about it, reporting them to the job centre and looking for more No, recruits? look, I think the real issue... I'm just here. quoting from Ed Miliband. Yeah, the, the, the root... He the, said this. The root of the problem, the root of the problem here is that in the end a lot of employers say, and they, when I was a shadow business secretary, used to say this to me all the time, they have chronic skill shortages. So the way of dealing with that is not to attack foreign workers or people who help provide the skills to the businesses now, it's to make sure that we have a skill system that actually provides people with the skills that our employers need. No, but I but, think but as when, when you were Shadow yes. Business Secretary, you weren't Business Secretary, but if you had been Business Secretary, would, you have, gone to, would you have gone to... Yeah, you're not likely to be we for wouldn't. the moment, are you? No, but would you, would you, would you have... <laughs> to <well>, me. <laughs> You, 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 don't, you don't know what's going to happen. Well, you quit the shadow cabinet. This is true. So, are you on offer again to Jeremy Corbyn? <laughs> Go on. I haven't had a call yet. There's a, there's a, <laughs> there's a reshuffle ongoing as we speak. But if... if, if, if anyway, in Sorry, terms back, of, back to the issue. In terms yeah, of business, is it, is it sensible for government to do what um, Ed Miliband seemed to be suggesting in 2012, is to look around at employers. There's an employer, there's an employer, there's an employer. They've got over a quarter immigrant workers. There's something wrong here, we must do something about it. Is that the kind of direct action you'd like to see taken? I, look, I don't think direct action in that way is the way that we solve this problem. We need to make sure... I mean, look, one of the things we need to do, we have a ridiculous snobbery in this country that says if you do a technical or vocational qualification, it's not as important as a degree, when that is where the big skill shortage is. So let's have more apprenticeships and let's end the snobbery in our country that says universities... Okay. Are that's going to be much more and, uh, and, and, and the Parsons, let's go back to Lucy Locke's question, which is disclosing how many workers you employ who are foreign encourages xenophobia and racism. Do you agree with that? Um, well, it, I certainly uh, don't think it's a good idea. Amber Rudd said, didn't she? She said, uh, you know, oh, don't call me racist, uh, we can't talk about immigration, we should be able to talk about immigration. Well, she should certainly be able to talk about immigration. She's the Home Secretary, that's part of her brief. If she can't talk about immigration, then things have gone badly wrong, haven't they? <laughs> but we've been having a debate about immigration for ten years, we haven't talked about much else in the last six months. She then rubbished, didn't she, the idea that Labour had set up this fund the uh, Migration uh, Impact, Impact Fund. Fund. Yeah. Thank you very much, Tricky, just in case I couldn't quite remember it. But it didn't, she said it was a terrible idea, you know. And then what did she do? She said, oh, we're doing our own fund, the Controlling yeah, Migration Fund. But it's not Controlling Migration, it's Controlling Migration Impact Fund. It's, in fact, a Migration Impact Fund, but just in a slightly different form. So this idea that we're naming and shaming companies, it shouldn't be shameful if you've got a company that you employ foreign workers because there's a skill shortage in Britain. The thing is, at the moment, we've got a skill shortage when it comes to negotiators for Brexit. 
They reckon we've got about 25 negotiators and we need about 500. Seems a good chance that the Ministry of Brexit will be employing quite a few people from abroad and may have to name and shame themselves. <laughs> You sit. you sit at the top there. Um, it just gets me is, is, um, is no one proud to be British anymore or English? Or well. Or Welsh. Or Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> Welsh, the cry goes up. But what, um, I mean, the thing is, I mean, if you say something against uh, foreigners or um, immigrants or whatever, you're immediately known as a racist and all the rest of it. And there used to be a thing called freedom of speech. Neil Hamilton. <laughs> well, I, 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 <laughs> what a segue that was. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, mean, I, I think this is a wholly deplorable idea and utterly irrelevant to immigration control and actually discredits the notion of the need for immigration control. We're adding to the population of this country at the minute, the United Kingdom, that is, a city the size of Cardiff every year from immigration alone. The scale of the inflow is what's the cause of the problem. When we joined the European Union, or the common market as we called it in those days, back in 1973, we were nine countries of broadly similar uh, economic prosperity. So we didn't have these vast movements across boundaries that we have today. The problem within the European Union was caused largely from 2004 when countries which were pro formerly behind the Iron Curtain, uh, became members of the European Union and their income levels were a small fraction, on average, of what ours are in this country. So, of course, people want to come and better their condition of life uh, and they want to move to countries where they can earn more money and live a better life for their families. A wholly admirable notion. The problem is that if the scale of the migration is too fast, then that creates social problems in the countries to which these people are coming. So. We're not against immigrants as such. They're not the cause of the problem as individuals. The problem is the scale of the flow, and immigration has to be controlled, otherwise all sorts of other problems are caused. And that is what actually creates racism and xenophobia. And, and, and you don't see Amber Rudd's proposals as trying to... I don't think that it'll make staunch. the slightest contribution to immigration, immigration. control all right. at all. And I think it discredits the argument, and therefore it's counterproductive. You, sir, in the middle there. Um, I just think it, the, the term of the, um, what Amber Rudd said was incredibly dangerous given what happened in Brexit straight after with um, Polish families and various other EU national families being attacked. Um, I just think it's been hard to enforce with the government anyway because it's a very complicated procedure but overall I just thought this is totally inappropriate given what's happened recently with Brexit. What, what, what was it about what Amber Rudd said? I mean the, the idea that they were taking, that it, people coming in were taking British jobs, is it that idea that you object to or what? Um, yeah, that, that sort of thing because like Andy Parsons put out there's a skill shortage in the, U, in the UK which a lot of foreign nationals uh, do for example in Boston there's a lot of people do um, work in the fields and what have you but a lot of British people won't do those types of jobs so a lot of, of you Nash will be willing to do those jobs and those hard manual jobs which people in Britain don't do anymore right. Leon Wood well, um, the last question was about whether or not UKIP had a future, and I think judging from the rhetoric on immigration that we heard from the Tory party uh, last week, we could say that Mrs May could be the next leader of uh, UKIP. Um, but I, I think what, what we saw in the Tory party conference, the vision that was given um, by Theresa May, is not something that I want to have anything to do with at all. The vision that I've got for Wales is one where we can all live together, regardless of where we came from originally. We should respect uh, each other's cultures and languages, but we should be able to, to live together in harmony. And this idea about separating foreign workers out from uh, the indigenous population, having some kind of list is a, a very dangerous road to go down, uh, I would suggest. And I'm just glad that as politics shifts further to the right, becomes more ugly, more divisive, more British nationalist in, its, uh, in the way it expresses itself, that we have an opportunity here in Wales to do something completely different. And we could create a politics here that is nothing like that whatsoever. So you don't believe in any immigration controls? 
That's not what I said at all. Um, there is an argument to have a, a sensible immigration oh, policy. Right. But look, well, we've got a doctor shortage here in Wales. Yeah. We are crying out. In, in the Rhonda where I live, there are uh, GPs retiring and absolutely no plan to replace them. 30% of our doctors in Wales were trained overseas. Our immigration problem here in Wales is that people are leaving the country. The young people are going to university and not coming back. The areas in the valleys that are becoming depopulated, schools are closing because of falling roles. If our areas were more successful economically, people would want to come and live amongst us, and we should be welcoming to them. All right, the, the woman at the back there. <laughs> and somebody had their hand up here. Keep your hands up if you want to speak. And there was a woman there, that's right. I'll go to you first, then I'll come to you. Yeah. You said the students are not coming back to Wales. There's nothing to come back for. That's the problem. Exactly. Well, That's the, exactly uh, uh, what I'm saying. Right. So how um, would you go about uh, encouraging like investment in Wales? Well, last week, my party um, uh, produced a plan for a National Infrastructure Commission for Wales, for example, which involves taking the opposite view to austerity and rather than closing down services, investing in our infrastructure, in our public services, in our broadband infrastructure. We've got a country that isn't connected north to south, for example, and we really do need to invest in those things that we missed out on when the times were good. The problem right, is now that, no, is that okay. money is short because of the, the bank in you, you in the third row. You in the third row there, yes. Um, I used to live and work in Spain, and when I spoke to Spanish people, they said that they felt that the UK wasn't welcoming to them. They wasn't welcome to people in the EU. So I wondered how the panel felt that people abroad see us as a country that they don't want to live and work in and contribute as part of Europe. I think right. that's well, terrible. Uh, hold on, I think hold that's on. Terrible. Okay, Leon. Uh, 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 Alan Cairns, just, uh, we must move on, but Alan Cairns, briefly on the suggestion that Leanne made that uh, Theresa May could be leader of UKIP and perhaps in that context <laughs> you comment on what well, the young woman there said. Well, c can I say that the message that came out of that referendum was that immigration needed to be controlled and the first stage of controlling it is acknowledging it and simply ignoring it, Leanne, right. doesn't mean it goes away and Jeremy Corbyn last week completely uh, failed to recognise the message that came from that referendum. And it's interesting that Leanne seems to be very open to immigration into the UK, yeah. but if it goes into Welsh-speaking communities, then she's got something very serious to say. OK. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hang on, hang on, hang on. He said something here now, and without yeah. anything to back it up. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Quote, quote me. Give me an, uh, anything that can back up what you just said. I can absolutely say that when there's uh, a migration into Welsh-speaking communities, um, that the integration in those communities, and I'm a passionate Welsh speaker, uh, supporting those communities, isn't necessarily as it is. And many of your members have taken direct action in the past. Many have broken the, the law to that effect. And I would hope that you would condemn them, to, uh, uh, bearing in mind the standpoint that what you're taking you now. Who are you talking about? What are you talking about? Leanne, what, what are you talking about? You, you, quite, you absolutely know that we can no, go to, we can go to communities. All right. no, here, absolutely and not. not. You and the audience will know as well that there are communities in Wales where there are nationalist uh, activists that take direct action against people who come in. It wasn't so long ago. Uh, where? It wasn't when? so long ago that some of the cottages were being burnt down. The hey, direct oh, action was banned. Hang on, that is nothing to do with Plaid Cymru. All right, what the, are you the, the woman, the woman there. Who, uh, go That's on, outrageous. Absolutely you, outrageous. You, a brief, a brief comment from you. I live in Llangenach in Carmarthenshire. Plaid Cymru are eradicating English stream primary education throughout the whole of Carmarthenshire. What do you say about that? You say you're open to all immigration. Plaid Cymru are anti-English language at the moment, especially in Carmarthenshire. I don't accept that, right? <laughs> How can uh, my party be anti-English language when the leader is uh, an English language speaker? That would be perverse, wouldn't it? Well, would like you, you don't speak Welsh. Speaking. I'm a learner. I'm not a fluent uh, yeah. Welsh speaker. We it, have, it, we it, have it, hundreds is, is of Alan, thousands of Alan members. Is Alan Cairns a better Welsh speaker than you? Yes, oh, by, yes, by a right. long chalk. Oh, by a yes. long chalk, right. Yes. But you're catching up. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm a learner I'm, and I'm not fluent. Okay. So wait, if, wait. if what you were saying was correct, that would be like a form of self-harm, wouldn't it? All right, let's go on. Let's go on. I, we couldn't have that one outside later. Oh, no, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. I didn't mean to say it. I said the discussion. 
<laughs> the discussion can go on later. Uh, Brian Warlow, please. The, the Prime Minister this week stated, we are the party of workers. If true, where does this leave the Labour Party? Yes, over and over again, the True Workers' Party, the party for ordinary working people, um, um, Mrs May said in her conference speech. Uh, Andy Parsons, what do you make of that? Uh, well, she was, um, she was stood up, wasn't she, uh, in front of her... The slogan was, a country that works for everyone, and then announced that she was bringing back grammar schools, something that conspicuously doesn't work for everyone. <laughs> she then said that she was going to uh, be the champion for the people that had defied the establishment, forgetting that she's been part of the establishment for decades and is arguably now the pinnacle of the establishment. She then went on to say, Britain should be a country, it doesn't matter where you were born. She obviously hadn't heard the speech from her own Home Secretary, her own Health Secretary, who was suggesting that we train up more junior doctors <coughs> and then we could tell the foreign doctors who are helping us out at the moment that they should go away. She hadn't heard from her Liam Fox, who basically said that people who were here from the EU, they, he wasn't going to say that they could stay because they were a negotiating chip, they weren't people as such, they were a negotiating chip. Well, if, if I may continue, I've got a little bit more to do, if that's all right. <laughs> the, the point about... What about Labour? Yeah? The thing about Labour was that we'd already heard from Philip Hammond. What's his now... His economic policy? His economic policy, what was he going to do? He wants to say that he's going to get rid of the deficit, but he's not going to actually tell us now when he's going to get rid of it. But he will get rid of it. Now, that sounds to me very similar to the policy that Ed Balls had before the last election. The challenge for Labour was always, could you actually get the people and the public to believe in what you had to say on the economy? Well, it seems they've convinced the Conservatives that that wasn't the worst economic policy at all. Mm. You've lost me there, because I thought we were talking about whether the Tory party was the party of the workers. Yeah, well, it was. Now you're saying it's adopted Ed Ball's policy. Does that well, make them... Well, <laughs> if you're saying, you were saying that they were taking Labour's, basically taking Labour's position yeah, in the that, centre. Yeah, you were saying so, that, I thought. Well, no, I believe I wasn't that saying was, anything. That was part of the question. <laughs> I thought yeah. that was part of yeah, the question. Yeah. And so, you think that is happening? So they, they, they have obviously tried to do that because they've basically adopted Labour's economic policy from before the last election. Oh, right. Alan Cairns. Um, I would say absolutely yes, uh, we're the party of workers. In the first instance, I would say... <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think we can recognise that unemployment in Wales, and this is something that we can celebrate, because I won't talk Wales down, that unemployment in Wales is the lowest across the whole of the UK. It's at 4.1%, uh, uh, whereas 4.9% across the Wales. Exactly. Well, that's, that's, pre that's precisely the point of why we've invited uh, a Labour advisor, former Labour advisor Matthew Taylor, to conduct an employment review, because we recognise working practices have changed. There's much more flexible working. Uh, there's much, much, so many more self-employed people. But those people aren't... If I can finish the point, those people aren't necessarily feeling the benefit of the economic growth. And as a result of that, that's why we want this review to be taking place, to in, order, in order to respond to the needs and the demands and offer the same sorts of protections to those sorts of people over workers' rights and, and issues that many people in larger organisations right. get. So absolutely right, we are the party of workers. Shukomuna. I'll but come the, to members but, of the audience but Before I actually answer the question, you've already commissioned an employment review yeah. which was done Precisely under so. Sajid Javid but when he was a business secretary and you haven't published it. So why are you commissioning someone else to do another one when you haven't even published the first one you commissioned? Well, I think, I, I hope you've noticed there's a change of Prime Minister in the interim and therefore it's up to her to set her agenda. And she said on the steps so, of so Downing Street... So what happens with no, the no, last she, one? No, no, she said on the steps of Downing Street, absolutely, that there are many people out there who don't feel that the economy is working for well, them not, or that the country is working not, for them. You're not answering there my question. There are people Can I just, in this hall in terms, and across, in terms of your point, hall and across of your the country point, David. who struggle to pay the mortgage, yeah, yeah. Uh, who the uh, don't get the same security that you and I get. And that's what the we're question right. was, let, let Chuka the question was about workers' rights, and I'm sorry, this is a complete... The question wasn't about workers' rights, it was workers, whether, whether workers, the Tories are the party of workers. Well, yes, clearly workers. they're not, because they were the party that introduced employment tribunal fees mm -hmm. which prevent workers from getting justice when they're treated unfairly at work. They also have made it harder for people to claim for unfair dismissal. They continually beat up on the organisations that represent working people, our trade unions, and now she wants to pose somehow as the great champion of workers and workers' rights. It's 
utterly ludicrous based on the last five to six years. So this whole thing, Tories working, I mean, there's a reason the audience were laughing. OK. <laughs> Let's, uh, before I go to the other two members of the panel, uh, the, the woman there, you, you man. I just wonder how the Tories can actually turn around and say they're the party of workers after what they've done to not only the mining industry but the steel industry, etc. But yeah, also right. the thing that they're currently trying to do uh, with the self-employed who are trying to claim working tax credit or universal credit as it's going to be now. They are making it so, so difficult for the self-employed who are just starting out on businesses. I have a friend of mine, yeah. she's been trying hard for two years to set up her own business and the stress of it, yeah. trying to fill in all these tax credit forms, etc., all the time, which you have just made far more difficult. <laughs> you just... But this exactly is why Matthew Taylor, a former Labour advisor, has been commissioned to look at these sorts of issues. Theresa May absolutely stands by this, and this is the sort of issues that people are complaining about. The chucker has just highlighted well, look, if, that we're seeking to resolve. So much about so workers' he, rights. So why do you did you agree, introduce do you agree, employment but, tribunal but, fees? But do why you, did you vote do, for that? Do you agree with Matthew Taylor conducting this review on behalf of the government? I think Matthew is a fantastic guy, well, very, very capable. But you don't you need him to tell right. you that what you've been doing has been fundamentally unfair. Denying people justice in employment tribunals, and you're now trying to tell us, you voted for that, you're now trying to tell everybody here that you care about their rights. The man in the centre there. Yeah. Um, thank you. I, I would just say that uh, do the Tories represent working people? Emphatically, no. In my view, any credible party that calls the opposition party the nasty party, I think is below contempt. I worked all my life. I'm I was proud at working, I, I had a good career. I don't consider my, and I'm a member of the Labour Party, I don't consider myself nasty and I don't consider the Labour Party nasty. So certainly the Tories are not represent, representing myself and I think a lot of other people too. All right. Leon Wood. Well, I think um, the pretending to reach out to working class people to take advantage <coughs> of the difficulties that the Labour Party, the infighting that has been going on within the Labour Party. I think there's a, an opportunistic attempt to try and take uh, advantage of that. But what I would say to everybody, particularly everybody in Wales, is just don't believe them. Remember what they did to us in the 1980s. Remember the deliberate deindustrialization of our communities. And we are still paying the price for that deliberate deindustrialization today. Before, before I came into this, this job as a politician, I worked as a probation officer in the Valleys, and I can tell you that some of the social problems that a deep-set second and third generation now that was started during the 1980s when those pits were deliberately closed, they should never be forgiven for that. Never. So, Neil Hamilton, what do you make of the Prime Minister's claim that uh, the Tories are the party of the workers? Well, now? neither Labour nor the Tories are the party of working people, of course. And, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll insert... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as, as for Leanne, now championing the coal industry, she wants to co close down all the coal-fired power stations in the country and rely on windmills to generate electricity instead. So, oh, if it was left to Plaid Cymru, we would now, certainly never have had a coal industry in Wales. But uh, Alan Plenty said that, uh, uh, that uh, employment employment levels in Wales are higher than ever before, and that's true. But when you look at the income levels of people who are in work, the uh, they've never been lower in relative terms. Fifteen years ago, Wales was second from bottom in the league tables of, of income in the United Kingdom, English regions and, and the nations. Today, Wales is the bottom of the league. And we've had a Labour government in Wales for the last 20 years as well, uh, and now a Tory government in the United Kingdom for the last six years. They've both failed the people of Wales and the United Kingdom in this respect. And of course the biggest losers from mass uncontrolled immigration have been those at the bottom of the income scale. People with the fewest skills and so for many people the minimum wage has now become the maximum wage and we in UKIP are the only party that's actually put forward a credible proposal for immigration control which would help those most at the bottom of the income scale. Right. That is, I think, the real party of working people right. is UKIP. There are a num number of hands up, and I'd just like to ask you to be brief, if you would, as I go around, and I'll take in...
two or three people. You, sir, there, you've been waving away. Yes. <laughs> I must, admit, I must admit I'm absolutely appalled by Alan's comment that he's the party for the working class. I work in public services, I'm proud to work in public services, and your party are killing the NHS. Shame on you. Okay. And, that's, uh, uh, and, and the, 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 the woman up there... Can tell us in Wales. The woman up there... <laughs> I work as a supply teacher through an agency. We used, supply teachers used to work through the council. Um, the government, the Conservative government, have created a system where we only work through agencies now, and the, we, we used to have um, small perks like travel expenses, which have now been taken away from us because we're not officially self-employed, and yet all the politicians claim all the expenses under the sun. All right, and the, the, the man in pink shirt up there. I can only speak from experience. I was in a thriving cosmetic industry up in the valleys. And when we needed the support, the only ones who were there were Plaid Cymru. Labour was speaking on TV and the Tories were nowhere to be seen. And it's all about when we need the support, that says it all. All right. They and, weren't there. And you in the front here. Can we reach the, can the microphone and get to you? Yes. How can, <laughs> how can the Conservatives say that they are the party for the working people when they have accelerated the uh, state pension age faster than they needed to and they have denied women born in the 1950s their state pension until age 66. Okay. That's the truth. Uh, and, and you, sir. I would come to you, but you agree with her. And, and you, sir, with the, with the, with the, with the daffodil. The beard. Yeah, with the beard, too, yes. Thank you, David. I'd just like be to say... Be brief, I, if you would. I would. Uh, I'll certainly be brief. Uh, Dave, uh, Alan, I, I you said you were a proud Welshman and proud to speak Welsh. Can you tell me how many of your cabinet are working class? I think the majority probably would have come from that sort of background from uh, uh, but so, well, they're all Etonians. Well, well I was well I'm not I mean I went to school just up the road and uh, my father was a welder in the steelworks so uh, I mean I know many of the people here a lot of the old Etonians have left haven't they because they changed the Prime Minister remember <laughs> well they, st they still you know to, we, I, I, I'm very surprised at how I can say they're the party wheels just going on to what some, some of the people said in here about public services, we've seen a demise of, of all our public services, mm -hmm. and not just through the Welsh. I know what you're going to say, Alan, right. you're going to pass it on to somebody else, but it started with Thatcher. Or whether you like okay. it or not, it's a decline of what happened in Wales. Well, we, Anne Wood is right on that. Thank you very much. We've heard a good deal about Welsh matters here, no, because we're in Neath. Not surprising, why shouldn't we? But I just want to go on to a completely different topic. I'm sorry, sir, but I want to go on to a completely different topic with a question from Mark Palmer, please. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Palmer. Uh, I'd like to ask, is it time for the West to accept it can only end the war in Syria by joining forces with Russia and accepting President Assad as a necessary evil? Joining with Russia and accepting Assad. Neil Hamilton. I think it's very dangerous for Western countries to blunder into uh, other countries whose internal politics they don't understand and which ultimately they can't control. Uh, we know the catastrophe of the Iraq war, of the intervention in Afghanistan. Uh, Western intervention has only made things far, far, far worse, not just for those countries themselves, but also through the exported terrorism, which is the inevitable consequence. And so I think the answer to the question is yes, actually. Uh, President Assad uh, isn't a very nice person, very obviously, but you can't see these things in a moral vacuum. You've got to ask yourselves, what is the alternative? Is it going to be better or worse? And I don't think that there's any of the interventions from Libya across to Afghanistan that the West, with their grandstanding politicians who like to strut on the world stage and to expose uh, for public view what they think is their moral superiority, have done an ounce of good, actually, for the people of those countries themselves. When we look at the horror of Aleppo today, can we really say that Western intervention in Syria has actually benefited the Syrian people? There may not be a solution to these problems. Many problems in the world don't have an answer. But what I do know is that what the West can do is not make things worse by blundering in and doing what they uh, can't... Uh, and, and, and making, thing, uh, making things worse because they have no idea actually what's going to follow. In Iraq, we had no follow-through plan. Right. In Afghanistan, we, we were unable to make any difference. And so we've end up, ended up just making things worse. All right. Nick. You sat there. Yeah. Um, 
In that case, Mr Hamilton, do you believe that we should continue bombing women and children? Mm. No, the Russians. I, don't, I don't believe we should be bombing women and but children. But you've just said that you agree that we should perhaps get into cahoots with the Russians. No, I, I, what, what that I'm was the question, joining forces with Russia no, well, and I, accepting President Assad. But that's no, what you've just I, agreed I, I to. I don't think that's, we should be involved in That's Syria. what you've just agreed to. No, that's it. All right, Alan Cairns, well, you, you voted think, in favour of bombing yeah. Assad, didn't you, when well, it came to the vote? I voted in favour of taking a, a action in Syria, yes, in, in terms of uh, uh, supporting uh, uh, the people against Daesh and the horrors that Daesh would, uh, would bring about. But I think for me, at the moment, and the immediate priority has got to be the humanitarian crisis. And the action that we need to take uh, in terms of supporting those in Aleppo, uh, only earlier this week the last hospital was bombed tragically, uh, uh, in, in, in Aleppo. Uh, we've seen the terrible photographs of children uh, who've lost their parents and families uh, uh, and children who've been orphaned as a result. So I think the starting point has got to be to carry on, to uh, is, has got to be to carry on talking in order to get to that US-Russian type ceasefire again so that we can get some humanitarian aid. We've got a proud record in supporting uh, uh, some of the most uh, uh, challenged uh, 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 countries in terms of uh, who are facing war and conflict and this is a good reason why I absolutely stand by our overseas aid uh, budget in order to support those communities and those people who absolutely need it now. Yes sir. Uh, I just can't understand why the UN um, really uh, take, or join together and put armed forces actually into Syria and clear it all up because all this bombing is causing lots of deaths by in individuals, innocent individuals and youngsters and I think there should be a plan to go in there on, by, by arms to actually clear it and put the, the state back to where it was. Uh, and do you think that would be effective? That they Far more effective than actually the con uh, constant bombing and kill killing of innocent people. The, the woman here in front. Well, I think it's tragic the way we see on television the bombing of the hospitals mm. and everything. I mean, years ago we went, we helped Ethiopia and all those other places. Look at Northern Ireland. We had to talk to finish the Northern Ireland conflict. There had to be talks, yeah. and I think there are going to be, have to be whoever talks and whatever. I don't believe we should go into Syria, because look at Iraq. Look at all the other places that we've been into, and look at them now. But I think we should definitely be talking, no matter what Assad is, and no matter what Putin is. They seem to have the power together. Some people think that they're in cahoots. Well, let's stop this terrible tragedy that's going on. But, and when you see, you see the pictures on television, I'm sure everybody, everybody's heart is breaking. It's awful. Ma Mark Palmer asked the question, do, do you agree with what she's saying? I do. What <clears> would you like to see happen? Obviously, I'd like to see the, uh, the war end. But I think unless we accept the reality that if we don't talk to uh, Russia and if we don't talk to Assad, then our current policies, they've been playing out for five and a half years. Are we prepared to have another five and a half years of not talking and watching more hospitals blown up? Andy Parsons. Well, our, our, our policy towards uh, Syria has is, is, is been sort of... It's not been well thought through, is it? David Cameron wanted to get the bombing in 2013. He didn't succeed with that vote. He then wanted to get the bombing in 2015. He succeeded with that vote. The only difference between those two votes was actually, in those two years, he actually wanted to bomb completely the different side from 2013 to the one he wanted to bomb in 2015. That doesn't seem like a particularly coherent foreign policy. We've got, obviously, the global players supporting different sides, and in terms of what we need to do, yes, we've got to talk. Um, but what can we actually do with the... At the moment, well, one thing we can do is there are a lot of Syrian refugee kids who are currently in Calais with links to British families, yeah. and we're keeping them behind that wall. Now, one thing we should definitely do is get them into this country and help them now. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, can I just say I think we've missed the boat on uh, discussions with uh, Russia and Assad. Um, we've had the opportunity over the last four or five years 
Unfortunately, if Mr. Trump wins the uh, American presidential elections, he's not known for his uh, foreign relations and his ability to talk nicely to other nations. So I think we've missed the boat on that. And if he gets into power, it, uh, it, it's going to be uh, quite a desperate situation would, for the whole world, really. Would you like to have seen the West ally themselves with Russia and accept Assad would remain in power? Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm not saying that, no. We've, we've had the opportunity to talk to people who could make a difference. Uh, we've missed the boat. Mr. Trump is certainly going to make a difference, but not in the manner that we'd all like it to be. Right. The result is going to be uh, a complete disaster for the globe, I'm afraid. Chuko Muna. Let's just be absolutely clear. We should not ally with Russia and accept Assad as the dictator of his country. We have seen to... Look, we seem to, in this discussion, have forgotten how what has happened in Syria came about. It came about because a brutal, nasty dictator in Assad refused to accept the desire for democracy amongst his people coming off the Arab Spring in 2011. That is how this started. So the idea that we should align with Russia and somehow prop up this nasty dictator incenses me. So and let's not forget, how just a moment, let us not forget, if you look at what the Russians and the Syrian forces have been doing in Syria, they have killed more people, more civilians, than Daesh and the Al Nusra Front put together. So they are the problem. Let us be absolutely clear about that. Now, of course, I mean, the reason that UK forces are taking action with others, uh, both in Iraq and Syria and in the ungovernable space in between is to degrade Daesh and to stop the terrorism that we see. Now, that has been successful to some extent in Iraq and it's beginning to render results in Syria. But no one is in, un, under any illusions that somehow that is going to solve the problem in Syria. But what three, you needed, three years ago, you voted against bombing Assad's I did. forces, didn't I, you? I did, and then I voted, f uh, I, I voted for action in Syria more recently. The reason I voted against it in 2013 was because there were, we, were we were not presented with any plan. We were not presented with details on the legal basis as to what, you know, why we were being asked to intervene. That was not the case more recently, but clearly there are three things. You need got to provide unfettered humanitarian access, which hasn't been provided so far, but ultimately you're going to need a negotiated settlement. You need to create the environment in which the UN can help precipitate right. doing that deal, but absolutely not. The idea of propping up the guy who started this all off in the first place, I think, is abhorrent. We're, we're, we're beginning to run out of time. Leanne Wood. Well, um, if you look at where most of the refugees within the European Union have come from, it's Syria. And it's an extremely complicated situation there. Nobody has the answers. I certainly uh, don't. But I don't think that... Uh, there's a military solution to this. There has to be a political solution, and there does have to be, if there is going to be an end to violence, at some point there is going to have to be talks. But I think what Andy said is, is spot on. There are limits to what we can do, but there are some things that we can do, and those Syrian children yeah. in Calais, we should be uh, offering those children a safe space and a home because the risks that they are facing in that Calais jungle, it just doesn't bear thinking about. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I, would like, I would like to hear what you and you and you have to say, but we've got to stop because our time's up. I've been getting away with it all.